please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. Like last Sunday, we're not going to be going through a book of the Bible, which is our typical practice here at the Garden Church, but we're going to be doing a topical sermon, meaning we're going to be going all over the Bible. So you're going to have to kind of be quick on the draw today. Uh, If you look in the front page of your Bible, you'll find page numbers for each book. You can also find it on your phone. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Galatia these words. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Father, we ask that as we study your word on the topic of the gospel, that you would help us today. That you would give us grace. Help me to preach with clarity your word, your truth, not merely my ideas, that you would open our hearts to shape us according to Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I was at the Greer's house a couple weeks ago, and Chapman and Sevy were playing. They're kind of like Chapman's kind of like Sevy's mentor, I would say. I apologize for that. Um, and uh, Sevy had this toy in his hand that he clearly loved. And they're playing with this toy, and he's holding this toy, and he had this smile on his face while he holds this toy. And, uh, and Kevin was kind of sitting in front of me, looking right at Sevy and, and smiling at him. And, um, and then there's this moment where Sevy looks up and catches Kevin's eye and this bigger smile comes across Sevy's face and he dropped the toy and ran into the arms of his father. Some people come to God for God's toys. Some people come to God simply to receive God's blessings. Some people come to God for God's abilities. Some people come to God for God's successes. But in the gospel, we come to God for God. We see God as beautiful in the gospel and we actually drop the toys of this world we drop the things that we cling to we drop our 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 careers and our dreams and our hopes and our and our and our talents not that we leave those things behind but they're no longer the things that define us they're no longer the things that shape us they're no longer the things that we run to and embrace and say oh thank you for being in my life but rather we drop these things and we run to God for God. In the beginning, humanity's relationship with God was severed. I mean, it was severed, severed. It was permanently broken and destroyed. Or so it looked. Even in that first, those first couple chapters in Genesis, as we saw last week, Genesis chapter 3, God promises that there is going to be redemption. Redemptive plan begins to open up. The gospel wasn't some afterthought of God where God thought, my goodness, I thought I could get these people saved by their own works and by their good deeds. I guess that's not going to work out. I guess I'm going to have to send them Jesus. No, from the very beginning, God planned that there would be a Redeemer who would come and crush the head of the serpent. And as the Bible continues, God calls a people to Himself to glorify Him and to display His beauty to the nations. 
But the blood of the bulls and the goats could never fully deal with their sin. While God put a system in place that would, where God would say, you know, I would, I would take one for one a blood of a lamb for, for your sin. And through the blood, we would have this rest, restored relationship. That, that system continued over and over and over because sin was never fully dealt with. And so in the fullness of time, meaning at the right time, at God's time, Jesus comes into the world and fulfills everything that the people of God were to fulfill. And what we discover in the life of Christ is that this chosen people was not actually just a a small ethnic group in the Middle East, but rather the chosen people is this global chosen family by God. The the promised land is not merely a small slice of property, but rather it's the whole world that God plans to give to His people, the bride where His Son will dwell. The final sacrifice to redeem the people comes through Jesus. And then Jesus, risen from the dead, commissions this people to take the gospel to the ends of the world and to preach in such a way that people come to God for God. To be restored with God. So Paul says, as he's writing to this church in in Galatia, that that Paul had planted, they, they, they loved him, But over time, they began listening to something else, and Paul was no longer their friend, but Paul, in their mind, became the enemy. He was the problem. He wasn't preaching this newer thing that they heard that they liked. And as Paul writes to this church in Galatia, what he says in verse 6 and 7 is, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, and you're turning to a different gospel. Somebody say different. A different gospel. Not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. That word different means altered or strange. In Romans chapter 7, verse 3, the word is used for adultery. Different. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24, the word is used for stealing what belongs to another. In Jude chapter 1, verse 7, the word is used to refer to the strange flesh that was pursued in Sodom and Gomorrah. In this ancient city of Galatia, what he's saying is is that these Christians have deserted Christ through abandoning the gospel that was given to them for an adulterous, unnatural gospel that belongs to another. It's adulterous in the sense that they're double dipping. They've got Jesus and they're also dipping into this other good news over here. It is unnatural in the sense that it is a farce. It is a replica. It is a cheap counterfeit. It belongs to another, not that there is another gospel, but it is the good news of somebody else. It's not your good news. It's not the good news of Christ that he's given you. It's not ours. In the case of Galatia, what we know is that it was the gospel of the Judaizers. These were people that were adding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. They did not deny the blood of Jesus for salvation. They added to it. They added to it. Jesus plus fill in the blank. They added to it. And this is how false gospels, counterfeit gospels, different gospels, twisted gospels, this is how they creep their way into churches all around the world. Because it's very similar to the real gospel. Look, if if somebody comes in and they're preaching the gospel of the flying spaghetti monster, 
We're going to abandon that. We're going to reject that. That is clearly not what we believe. But if I come preaching the blood of Christ, plus let me give you a couple other things that you need to really be right, to really be justified before God, you're going to find a, a, a lot of hearing in a lot of congregations. This is part two of a series called Peculiar People, where we are looking at various marks of what it means to be a healthy church. Last week we talked about preaching, expositional preaching. And this week what we're looking at is the gospel. A church not only preaches the word rightly, but a church also understands, embraces, proclaims, and holds on to the right gospel. In other words, the right understanding of the message of the good news of Jesus Christ that is given to us through God's Word. To, to not know the gospel and to be a church is actually absurd. It would be like starting, starting a McDonald's and you don't know what a hamburger is. You know, it would be like starting a pizza shop or working for a pizza shop and taking somebody's order and you're like all right cool so tell me what a pizza is like what is can you can you describe it to me so I know what to make and you say I thought this was a pizza shop can you describe to me what a pizza is and they describe a hamburger now that, that's absurd yet there are thousands, millions perhaps, of professing Christians that profess Christ, churches that look like churches, but don't know the gospel, can't articulate the gospel. You ask a hundred professing Christians what the gospel is, you might get a hundred different responses, which is weird. When, when Paul says, I'm surprised you've quickly abandoned the one gospel. Meaning, he assumes they know what he's talking about. He assumes they know what this message is. Some don't know the gospel at all. Um, and I, I, I appreciate, if, you're, if you are a person here, you're like, I really don't know what the gospel is, welcome to the Garden Church, seriously. This is a place for people who don't know what the gospel is to come because we try to be clear on it. And uh, Tanika, uh, who, man, I miss Tanika already. Tanika moved to Atlanta to get married. Um, Tanika shared her story with us. Uh, she, Tanika was someone who um, was in church, did the church thing, and uh, went through our membership class and everything, and she, she, uh, she came in, we, we sat down to do a membership interview, and I asked her, I was like, tell me what the gospel is. And she really just didn't know what the gospel was. She kind of told me something that was not the gospel, talked about works and standing before God based on her, what she can do. And so I told her, I was like, pretty sure, I was like, you're not a Christian. I just want you to know that. Like, based on what you say, you're not a Christian. And she started crying, and I'm like, oh, no, I, I came on too strong. And then she says, I'm so thankful you said that. Because I was sitting in my car trying to figure out how to tell a pastor I don't know if I'm a Christian. And nobody's ever been clear with me before. You see, some just don't know the gospel. Others think they know the gospel and it's a corrupt version of it. You know, they're adding, usually, let me just say this, the biggest heresy that we face still today is justification by works. Meaning I stand before God right based on what I do, what I've done, what I can do, what I will do. That is a heresy, and it is the biggest heresy we still face today. Sharing the gospel, telling somebody what the gospel is, and they never once mention Jesus, they just, mention, they just talk about what they do. Now I don't fault the professing Christian for this because they haven't been trained. So often pastors don't know the gospel. And there's a sense in which I, I, my heart breaks for the pastors because they haven't been trained. 
in what the gospel is. They've been trained in how to be winsome and funny and likable and speak in powerful ways, but they have never been trained in the gospel and how to speak the gospel, preach the gospel, find it in the Bible and apply it to the person's life. And so I'm just simply saying this. Shouldn't Christians know the gospel? Shouldn't Christians be able to articulate, and I would say even point in the scriptures, what the gospel is? Otherwise, we are selling something other than the good news of Jesus Christ. For example, a Baltimore area preacher last Easter said this. He said, Jesus didn't hang on the cross as life insurance. I tend to agree with that. He said, Jesus hung on the cross to give you life and life more abundantly. I agree with that, but you've got to tell me now what you mean by life and life more abundantly. Well, then he tells me. He says, so that every gift, talent, and ability he's placed inside you can be maximized. So that here on earth, people will look at your life and say, I know you, and I see your life, and you ain't that good. What's your secret? And you say, it's not me, but God. So Jesus died on the cross so that your gifts, skills, and talents, and abilities would be maximized to saying. I don't even know what that means. Like, I don't, I mean, Elon Musk has maximized his gifts, talents, and skills, and people look at him and they say, you're not very good. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> That's not the gospel. He just described Elon Musk. You see, there is this confusion that takes place to where so often, you know, I don't know if we're trying to be cute or what, but like we walk out and like, I don't even know what, what that means, that Jesus died to maximize my abilities. I don't know what that means. And it, it leads us to the subtle, if not so subtle, justification by works, meaning the gospel effect, what salvation is for, the reason that Jesus died is for the maximization of your talents. Therefore, if your talents are not maximized, you see the problem. You have no assurance before God. If Jesus died so my skills would be maximized, so I would do great things, so people would just be wowed by my life, and I'm not doing very well, and nobody's wowed by my life. You see, it's just it's made right by what we do, by what we can accomplish. Now perhaps, you know, giving the preacher the benefit of the doubt, perhaps what he's talking about is that there's this gospel effect, that through the gospel you'll be a better steward of your talents and resources, and you'll do really well. Perhaps that's what he's getting at. It's just not what he says. You see, there's, just, there's so much confusion to where you can walk away and say, I just don't know what that means. You see, what he failed to say is this. Jesus died on the cross to pay sin's penalty to purchase a people for God to whom they will give an answer so that you are forgiven of your sins, filled with the hope and assurance of God's love for you and know that one day you will be raised to life apart from even the presence of sin. Now, I honestly don't know if Perhaps some preachers, leaders, Christians take all of that for granted. They just take for granted the fact that they have God. And they don't want any more of that. They want what God can give them. Or perhaps they think that if they talk about forgiveness of sins, the need for a Savior, the cross, that maybe it would sound too churchy, too religious. It would turn people off. But here's what I know. I know that we need to be justified. Meaning we need 
to be made right. Everybody needs to be justified. And I would say that everybody sitting in this room has this deep sense that you need to be made right. In some fashion, you are seeking acceptance and you need to find acceptance. And perhaps some well-meaning Christians seek to manipulate the pure gospel and talk about honing in on your talents or your morals or doing better. But the problem is these things always fail us. Meaning I can never succeed enough to feel right. I can never be talented enough to feel right. I can never be moral enough to feel right. And so you find these people on this endless rat race of trying to be self-justified. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, just over a couple books in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, we see this. Without the gospel, we would have nothing. Without the gospel, we would have nothing. Let me give you two Ps. Power and pillar. Say it with me. Power and pillar. Power. Romans chapter 1, we see that the gospel is power. It is, in fact, the power of God. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes. Paul was not ashamed of the gospel message. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. Meaning our biggest problem in life is not money. Our biggest problem in life is not lacking direction. Our biggest problem in life is not a lack of friends. Our biggest problem is that we need to be saved. So therefore, the gospel is not, not some tag at the end of a moralistic sermon, but rather the gospel is the power of God for salvation. People must be saved from sin and death and without the gospel of Jesus Christ, faith communities can do some really cool stuff, but they have no power for the most important stuff. Power. Number two, pillar. Pillar. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. You don't have to turn there. Stay in Romans because we're going we're gonna to hang out in Romans for a little while. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Paul here calls the church of the living God a pillar and a buttress of the truth. Meaning, the church is this structure, if you would, that props up and displays the truth, which is a nickname for Paul for the gospel message. So while the gospel is the power, it's our job to prop it up and put it on display. Meaning the gospel is not just something, not only something we use in our evangelism, it is. It's not just something we preach on Sundays, it is. But rather the gospel is the whole of our work together. Like what are we displaying as a congregation in our discipleship, in our counseling, in our correcting, in our hospitality, in our love? It is all to prop up and display the gospel meaning we are to be shaped by the gospel and then we are to lift up the gospel for all to see. Are you with me? And so the next question is this. So what is the gospel? You might be like, Joel, you've been talking for like 20 minutes now and you haven't even told us what the gospel is. So what is the gospel? I want to do this. The rest of our time, I want to look at these two questions. Number one, what is the gospel? And I'm going to give you four questions as a framework to answer that question. And then the second is this. What is the gospel impact? And we'll close with that. So first, what is the gospel? Keep your thumb in Romans chapter 1, because we're going to go back there, and turn over to Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. 
Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. You know who the first gospel preacher was in the New Testament? Jesus. That's right. Matthew 4, verse 23. Jesus is the he in verse 23. It says, and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the, what's the word? The gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Jesus is proclaiming the gospel. That word gospel there is a compound word in the Greek, two words put together, u angelion. U means good, angelion means message. So we're talking about a good message or good news. That's what gospel means. So if somebody says, what's the good news of Christianity? It's the same question as asking, what's the gospel of Jesus Christ? So he's preaching the good news here, he says, of the kingdom. Jesus is preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's coming. And he presents himself as the very center of that kingdom, the door, the king, the one who sits on the throne, the one who you come through, the way nobody comes to the Father but through me. So he's proclaiming this good news of the kingdom. And then it goes on to say, and he's healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Now notice here, the gospel is not the healings. He's preaching the gospel, that's one thing, and he's healing every disease and every affliction. That's another thing. Well, what's the healing that's happening then? The healing are signs that came along with Christ that he then passed on to his apostles to confirm the gospel message is the true message. Meaning the great thing about Jesus' ministry here is actually not the healings, but it's actually the message that he's proclaiming. The healings are pointing to that message saying, listen to this man. Listen to what he's saying. Listen to the message that that he's giving you. Now, in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, don't turn there, but Jesus Jesus, uh, here, Mark is uh, uh, framing this all within the context of the gospel. Mark 1 starts off talking about the good news. uh, and, And then in verse 15, he calls his first disciples, and in doing so, he says, repent and believe the good news. Meaning, Jesus says that there's a way into this kingdom. Think of it this way. If there's a kingdom coming to Baltimore, and this kingdom is going to eradicate all sinners, is that a good thing for you? You might say, oh man, that sounds awesome. I want to be in a Baltimore with no sin. Until you say, like me, wait a second, I'm a sinner. Is that a good news? Meaning this, it's only good news if there's a way for a sinner to be transformed into a saint. You see, it's only good news if there's a door into the kingdom. And so the gospel then demands that we give a response. If you give the gospel to somebody and talk about the cross and you don't tell them how to receive that salvation, you actually have given them information, you've told them good news for somebody else, but you haven't actually told them good news for them because they don't know where the door is. Where is the way? The response is to repent and and to believe. We'll get into this in a little bit. Jesus says, repent and believe. Now, is Jesus' gospel, in, in the gospels, is that the same gospel that Paul preaches and that the others preach in the new, in, throughout the new, rest of the New Testament. Because there are some folks who would say that Jesus' gospel is a different gospel than Paul's, that Jesus came and preached the gospel of the kingdom, whereas Paul came and preached the gospel of forgiveness. Now, I'm going to argue that they are not two different gospels, but there is only one gospel and one king and one savior and one kingdom. One gospel. Jesus preaching the gospel of the kingdom, Paul preaching the gospel of forgiveness. I'm going to face value. You've got to be forgiven to come into the kingdom. Amen? But let me show you textually how we can know that they preach the same gospel. Look at, skip over to uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, 14. When you're there, say amen. You, uh, You guys tracking with me still? Flipping through, I hear those pages. 
Amen. Matthew 24, 14. Look what Jesus says. He says, And this gospel of the kingdom, meaning the gospel that Jesus has been preaching, this gospel will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. You see, what Jesus is saying is that the message he's been preaching, he's going to pass that message on as he trains his, his apostles, which includes Paul. It's going to be the message that he sends them into all of the world to preach. Meaning it's the same gospel. There's one gospel. One message. Well, we still have an answer, have we? What is that gospel, right? So what is it? Let's go to Rome, back to Romans chapter 1. Paul explains to us in the first four chapters of Romans what the gospel is. And just for those of you that already miss being in Romans, we're back in Romans this morning. Amen? Romans chapter 1 through 4. Paul's writing a letter now here to the churches that are in Rome. Christians that he's never met before. And in the first four chapters, he outlines very succinctly for them what the gospel is. His outline begins in verse 16 of chapter 1 as he states the theme of his writing, the gospel. What he says there is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God and of salvation. And then he goes on for the rest of the four, uh, Romans, really, but particularly in those first four chapters, to tell you what he means by the gospel message. What is this one message? Let me give you a framework for understanding the gospel. Four questions. Number one. To whom are you ac accountable? To whom are you accountable? Number two, what is your problem? What is your problem? Number three, what is your solution to that problem? And number four, what is your response to receive that solution? Are you with me? Meaning, if you are accountable to your job, first and foremost, and your main problem is that you don't have money in your bank account, and your solution is to work harder and get a raise, then the response is to butter up to your boss and ask for a promotion. I just came up with that, all right? That might be an issue for some of you, but we're talking about who are you most accountable to? What is your core problem? What is your core solution? What is your core response? My point is this. How you answer these questions is how you understand what the gospel is. It's how you frame what you believe the gospel is. And so if you're off in your understanding of the gospel, it's because you're off in your answer to one of these four questions. Romans 1 through 4 lays out these questions. Greg Gilbert in his book, What is the Gospel?, which I recommend you guys read. He, he draws out these four crucial questions in Romans 1 through 4. He puts it like this. Number one, who made us and to whom are we accountable? Number two, what is our problem? Are we in trouble and why? Number three, what is God's solution to that problem? How has God acted to solve this problem? And number four, how do I, myself, right here, right now, how do I come to be included in that salvation and what makes this good news good news for me and not just good news for somebody else? So let's walk through Romans here. First, who made us? To whom are we accountable? Romans chapter 1, verse 18. We see that the wrath of God here is revealed from heaven. The wrath of God. Why? Well, verse 21. Although they knew God. The, 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 the one that we are accountable to is the God who made the heavens and the earth. He is the one before we, uh, we will be judged. Meaning, you're not ultimately accountable to your spouse. You're not ultimately accountable to your parents. You're not ultimately accountable to the, your boss or to the Baltimore City Police. You are ultimately accountable to God Himself. And then somebody says, oh, I get that, and that's why nobody can judge me. Only God can judge me, and God knows my heart. To which I say, you think that's a good thing? 
You know your heart. Be honest with yourself. Like, if we look at our hearts, I mean, my goodness. I forget who it was, but they said, my heart has committed sins that my hands never got to. I mean, when you think about the sins of your heart, my goodness. Yeah, God does know your heart. That is a true statement. But that leads us to the next question. What is our problem? What is our problem? Romans chapter 1, verse 23, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They've rejected God. Skip over to chapter 2, verse 1. He says, therefore, you have no excuse. This is his conclusion. We stand before this God with no excuse because we are rejectors of this God. Chapter 3, verse 9. He tells us that Jew and Gentile alike are all under the power of sin. Meaning, this doesn't just affect some people. This affects everybody. We are all under the power of sin of sin sin has a sway on us chapter 3 verse 19 tells us just in case you're mistaken he says the whole world is accountable to god everybody across the entire sphere of the globe will stand before god in their sin and be judged by this God and be held accountable to this God that they know that they've rejected, is what he's saying in Romans. Well, that leads us into the next question, because so far all I've given you is bad news. The next question brings us the good news. What's the solution? Romans chapter 3, verse 21. It says, now righteousness is revealed apart from the law. Wait a second. Apart from the law, meaning the law that God has given us, saying this is the perfect law, this is what it means to be right. He's saying that there is now a righteousness that has been revealed apart from doing good. Apart from being perfect. Apart from perfect obedience before God. A righteousness, a justification that can somehow be ours. How? Verse 34 of chapter 3. He says we are justified by grace as a gift. As a gift. The blood of Christ has been shed so that we might be forgiven. Christ lived the life following the, uh, God with perfect obedience that we should have lived. And now, because of His work on our, behalf, on our behalf, He says that we are justified as a gift given freely to us. Fourth question then is this. How then can I right now be included in this salvation? Look at chapter 4, verse 24 of Romans. He says, it's for us who God will credit righteousness. Look at that word credit. Credit. When you get credit for something, it's not not because you earned it. You were given credit. God credits, He donates into our bank account the righteousness of Christ. Christ. It's a free gift. It's for us who He will give us this righteousness. For us who, He says, believe in Him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So what's our response here? here? He says to believe in Jesus Christ risen from the dead. That's how we receive it. To believe in Christ. To believe. To repent and believe. Repentance is the other side of the same coin as belief. The Gospel writers use these two words interchangeably and often put them together. To repent is is not to follow a bunch of rules, actually. That's the fruit of repentance. To repent is a change of mind. 
To repent is saying, I've been going this direction and I'm changing my belief about where I'm going. I'm changing my mind about where I'm going and I'm now going this direction. That is synonymous with believing in the risen Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins. And that's our response. Jesus says, I am the way, the door, the sinner. Walks then through Christ. How do you come to Christ this morning? There is no ticket to purchase. There is no Groupon that you can found, find for a discount because the, 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 the cost is priceless. The only way it can be received is if it is given to you freely. Oh, and Christian, who's been with Jesus for many years and you've fallen away and you're struggling and you feel far from God, What does it look like to come back to God? You don't earn your way back. You don't purchase your way back. You don't give extra money to come back. You don't even, God doesn't even require a time period to prove yourself. He says, come to me in faith. Turn and see the work of Christ on your behalf and and receive it. Drink from him. Gilbert points out that this same framework, four questions, can be applied throughout all of the gospel preaching in the New Testament. So let me give you a couple examples. Turn, turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts 10. Are you sticking with me still? Acts chapter 10, verse 39 through verse 42. This is Peter preaching to Cornelius. Peter, a Jew, preaching to a Gentile Cornelius. He says this, they put him to death In verse 39, end of verse 39, by hanging him on a tree, verse 40, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and made him to appear. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Notice that same framework. Number one, who you're accountable to. He is the judge of of all. Verse 42. What's your problem? You've rejected him. Verse 39. What's the solution? Verse uh, uh, 40. God raised him from the dead. Meaning, if Jesus died on the cross for your sins, taking the weight of your sin in his death on the cross, and that put him in the ground, if Jesus stayed in the ground, then the curse of death has never been overturned. He must have had sin that he, for himself to pay. But, but Jesus was raised from the dead, which gives you assurance, he says, of your forgiveness, of your justification. And verse 42, what's your response? To believe. To believe. Right now, believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Again, go to Acts chapter 13. Here, Paul is in Perga. And Paul goes into a synagogue, and there he preaches in the synagogue to Jews who do not believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and he wants them to know Christ. In verse 16, he begins to preach, and he preaches from David, King David, all the way through John the Baptist. Then when you get down to verse 37, he says this, but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Again, those same four questions provide a framework for us. Who are we accountable to? Verse 31 says, He will judge. What is our problem? Verse 31 We're going to be judged by Jesus. Oh, and by the way, if you contributed to his death, you will stand before him as the judge. Verse 31, what is our solution? It says Jesus was raised to give us assurance. And number four, what is our response? Verse 30, he says to repent, turn from your sins, and trust in Jesus Christ. Or verse 39, rather. By him, everyone who, uh, who believes. Acts 17. Let's turn to Acts 17. Verse 
Verse 30 of Acts chapter 17, second part of verse 30. He says, God commands people everywhere to repent, verse 30, verse 31, because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, I previously just read you my notes for Acts 17 when I was explaining Acts 13. So let me remind you of what I just said, and then I'll go back. <clears throat> Acts 17, we're accountable because Jesus will judge us, verse 31. Our problem is that we're going to be judged, verse 31. Our solution is that Jesus was raised to give us our uh, assurance, verse 31. And our response is to repent, verse 30. Going back to Acts chapter 13, don't worry about going there, but what I meant to say about those verses is this, that we are accountable to the God who raises Jesus from the dead. Our problem in verse 39 of, of Acts uh, 13 is that there are things you could not be freed of. You are in chains. You are in bondage. Our solution is that through him, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. And our, our, our response by him, everyone who believes is saved, verse 39. My point is simply this. We see the same gospel all throughout. We see the same gospel. What is the gospel? Know who you're accountable to. God, the creator. Know what your problem is. You've sinned against God. The perfect God who made us to reflect his image. We're rebels against God. Know what your solution is. That Jesus came and did for you what you could not do for yourself. Dying on the cross. Rising on the third day. He brought you life and forgiveness of sins. And know what your response is. It's not to be a better person. It's not to try harder. It's not to get yourself together and then you'll come. No, those who try to get themselves together first will never come at all. It's to turn in repentance and belief to Jesus Christ and to receive His salvation. To, to say, this is mine. This is mine. I'm saved by His work. I'm clinging to His work. Now that is the gospel, saints. And it's given to us by God. At no point did humans come up with the gospel. This is a message that the commander gave us and said, I need you to go deliver this message to everybody else. Do we then have the liberty to alter it? To make it more palatable? To take out some things? To ignore some things? I don't think so. I've used this story before, and I'll, I'll share it again because it's a good analogy. In the movie 1917, it's a movie about two British soldiers who were sent with a life-or-death message. There were 1,600 soldiers that were in a trap, and a commander hands them this message, which is to tell them about the trap, that they're going to die. It's an important message, and they have to cross dangerous terrain risk their lives in order to deliver this message. And the likelihood of them dying is high, but if the message doesn't get delivered, 1,600 will most certainly die. And so they're willing to risk it all to save 1,600. Now, what if when they finally arrive, they keep the message in their pocket because they think, they're not going to accept this. They think of themselves as victors, and they're not going to like the fact that there is sudden loss that is to face them. And so they make the message more palatable. And they say, hey, the message is, go forward. You are a victor. Well, they might, victory might be a possibility, but they left so much out of that message they have no clue what that even means. What does it mean that I'm a victor, you see? You see, we are not to tweak or change the message in order to make it more palatable, in order to, to somehow make people feel better about themselves, but rather, check it out, the gospel message is the power of God unto salvation. 
It is. It's what people need to be saved, to faithfully deliver that one message. It saves, it sanctifies, and it secures. Meaning, what message do you need to hear in order to be saved? It's the message of Christ's work on your behalf. What message do you need to be here which fuels your sanctification? Is it moralistic sermons? No, it is Christ's work on your behalf. What message do you need to hear which will end that exhausting search for meaning and success and being right? It is Christ's work on your behalf. It is God's power of salvation for your life. People may reject you. Your talents may fail you. Your dreams may disappoint you. Your, your failures may crush you. But the gospel says, I am yours and you are mine. What more can we want when God tells us through His Word, I am yours and you are mine. We, we drop those toys and we run into the arms of our Father. Amen? So that's the gospel. What is the gospel impact? Do, you, do your talents matter? Well, no, they do. Absolutely, your, your talents do matter. And in the gospel, you're finally free to steward your talents and abilities and gifts in a way that's freed from the fear of man, and I think you'll do better. Does your success at your job matter? Sure, at some level, right? I hope you would say that. It matters to me. I don't want you to fire me. But listen, because of the gospel, we can forget ourselves and stop focusing on ourselves and gazing at our own navels and begin to look upward and outward and actually be useful. We can take risk and be bold because we know that even if this thing that I'm working on fails, I haven't failed. The gospel transforms every bit of who we are, every aspect of our life, from our home to our job to our communities. But let me say this. For the gospel to be the gospel, it must be good news for the person who has no talents to offer this world. It must be good news to, for the person who his, his body has shut down and has been deemed utterly useless to this world. And that person hears, you are mine. And I am yours. For the gospel to be good news, it must be good news to the most vile person on this world. It must be good news to the person who's made a wreck of their life and will forever live with the consequences and they hear, you are mine, and I am yours. For the gospel to be good news, it must be good news to the thief on the cross who has no more time left in this world. And he looks to Jesus, and Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. For the gospel to be good news, it must be good news to the 95-year-old man who's lying on his deathbed and every bit of his success, all of his accomplishments, all of his, his kids and grandkids that he would raise and have an impact on, every job that he's ever worked is all in the rearview mirror of his life. And he knows that he cannot stand before God. And he hears the gospel message. And he looks to Jesus Christ and in that dying breath, he says, God, forgive me of my sins. And the response, you are mine, and I am yours. The gospel is good news for everybody who will believe. The gospel is good news for the self-loather. As God says, I have loved you since before I created the world. The gospel is good news for the guilty as God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The gospel is good for the weary. When Christ calls to us, come to me all who are weary and I will give you rest. 
The gospel is good news for the anxious. As God says, the work is mine. And all things work together for good. And the circumstances that you face in life cannot alter my good plans for your life. The gospel is good news for the shamed. As Christ bore our shame on the cross. The gospel is good news for the performance driven who has accomplished all that they can possibly accomplish in this life and they still don't feel worthy. Jesus says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without my father seeing it, observing it. Oh, don't you know that you are worth more than the sparrows? I know even the hairs on your head. Saints, you are worthy. You're worthy before God in the gospel. You're more worthy than your job gives you credit for. You're more worthy than your talents display. You're more worthy than your abilities show. You're more worthy than your morals prove. Because Christ is more worthy. Because Christ is the pearl of great price. Christ is the preeminent one among his brothers who stands head and shoulders above the rest. And there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. To him is given a throne and he resides on that throne forever and ever. He is the king of kings. And you, through the gospel, are in him. So in the gospel, there is no one who is ugly. No one unworthy. No one lost. No one is a mistake. No one is unloved. No, come to these waters, church. See your Savior. Know God's love. God loves you. God loves you. Good news. You are loved by God. Father, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ through which we are reconciled to you by his blood. God, I pray that the person in this room who does not know Jesus Christ would turn to him now, receive forgiveness of sins. I pray, God, for the saints in this room who have been following after Christ for some time or many, many years even, that they would know that they are not past this good news of Jesus Christ, that they would find their hope, their union, their being in Christ and in Christ alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.